1152, outside Paris. Newly divorced from her ex-husband, Louis VII, King of France, Eleanor is going back home to Aquitaine. Though she has to be cautious, because as it turns out, as Duchess of her homeland, she's a prime target for a very specific type of kidnapping. It is not unknown for nobles to kidnap heiresses and forcibly marry them to gain their land, knowing that the church almost never grants a divorce once a marriage is joined. In fact, this was such a concern that the last time she was single, Louis's father had sent 500 armed men to escort her to her wedding. And now she's heard that there are two nobles already lying in wait to ambush her on the road. But Eleanor will slip the net, arrive safely home, and dispatch a messenger to a man she's only met once. That man is Henry, Duke of Normandy, and the letter asks him to come marry her immediately. Thanks so much to Factor for keeping us fed on a busy schedule. Last episode, we discussed how King Louis VII and Eleanor, Duchess of Aquitaine, successfully annulled their marriage on the grounds of consanguinity. But it does bear asking, why? Like, why would Louis let Eleanor go? I mean, she owned much more territory than his piddly holdings around Paris. Well, from Louis's perspective, he needed a son. Unlike in Aquitaine, women in northern France could not inherit, and Eleanor, now around 30 and only having produced two daughters in 15 years of marriage, didn't seem to be able to bear more children. So, he let Eleanor go, and his court set about finding Louis a new wife, while also crafting vicious rumors that pinned the marriage's failures on her. And sure, while Aquitaine remained Eleanor's for now, when she died, it would go to their eldest daughter Marie. Unless, of course, Eleanor remarried and produced a male heir, but come on, I mean, who would dare displease their overlord by marrying an ex-queen of France, am I right? Oh, hey there, Henry. Didn't see you right away. Also, at the end of the last episode, we did cheat a bit by saying Henry was the heir to the English throne, but that was advancing the timeline a little bit. Because, you see, England was going through a civil war at the time, known as the Anarchy, a term which pretty much sums things up. But to put it very, very simply, Henry's grandfather had been the King of England. But when he tried to designate his daughter Matilda, Henry's mother, his heir, a succession crisis broke out, and a noble named Stephen seized the throne. So while Henry did have claim to the throne, he wasn't exactly next in line. Heck, he and Stephen weren't even on good terms. They were fighting a low-intensity war. However, Henry was on good terms with Louis, who Henry had finally declared fealty to in exchange for formal recognition as Duke of Normandy. But as you can imagine, that relationship turned pretty frosty. Once Henry slipped off to Aquitaine to marry Eleanor in a hasty ceremony less than eight weeks after the divorce. Yeah, those two worked fast. So fast, in fact, there's been speculation that they set this whole marriage plan up in advance. Adding insult to injury, Henry and Eleanor were actually more closely related than she and Louis had been, and four months later, Eleanor was pregnant. Yup, that's right! Two girls in a decade and a half of marriage with Louis, but Eleanor gets pregnant almost instantly after marrying Henry. Now that might have been for a couple of reasons. First off, Henry was 19, a decade younger than Eleanor, and, well, let's put it this way. Both of Louis's daughters with Eleanor were born after a bishop and a pope blessed the wedding bed and encouraged them to have kids, but Henry didn't really need any godly encouragement. In fact, their marriage appears to have been a genuine love match and extremely passionate. Henry was considered handsome, with red gold hair and an athletic frame, and he loved to hunt, to read books, and of course, to beat the living snot out of his enemies on the battlefield. And Henry kept racking up the wins. The same day Eleanor gave birth to their son William, securing Aquitaine for their family, King Stephen's son, the heir apparent to the English throne, died suddenly, supposedly struck down by God while sacking a church. Clearing the way for Henry to invade England, battle Stephen, and force the king to sign a treaty confirming Henry as the legitimate heir to the English throne. Eleven months later, Stephen died, and Henry and Eleanor were crowned king and queen of England. And just to hammer home how nuts this timeline is, Eleanor had gone from a royal divorce in France to the throne of England in two and a half years. And in doing so, they joined Aquitaine, Normandy, and England, founding a continuous territory stretching from the Scottish border in the north to the Spanish border in the south. It's what would become known as the Angevin Empire, covering all of England and half of France. Eleanor had reshaped European politics, founded an empire, and she did it while pregnant most of the time. In fact, she was already pregnant with another son when she was crowned. Those two sons would be the first of eight children born within 14 years, five sons and three daughters, seven of which lived to adulthood. In other words, between age 30 and age 44, Eleanor was pretty much either constantly pregnant or in recovery. Meanwhile, she was also serving as regent while Henry was off trying to repair the damage wrought by the Civil War. 
Now, exactly how much power Eleanor wielded during this time is a matter of debate among historians. Some think she was quite influential as regent of England and was governing Aquitaine directly, while others suggest that Henry's counselors boxed her in and she mostly served as a rubber stamp even in her own territory. But either way, it's interesting that Eleanor was on and off governing the kingdom during one of its most turbulent periods as Henry crushed rebellions, reformed the English state, campaigned in Ireland, feuded with Louis, and had a tragic standoff with his friend Thomas Becket, Archbishop of Canterbury, whose murder he accidentally ordered when two knights overheard him ranting about the man. On all of these consequential issues, Eleanor's voice and opinions are missing, though we do get brief glimpses of her and Henry's personal life, because not all was well in this union. First of all, some sources claim Eleanor clashed with Henry's power broker mother, Empress Matilda, and second, well, unlike the dull but faithful Louis, Henry was extremely active as a lover, including with other women, which he didn't hide. Again, sources and interpretations disagree. Some historians claim that she reacted with a detached worldliness and point out that she attended court events with Henry's mistresses. Others point to stories of epic screaming matches, which would not be out of character for Henry, who was known for extreme rages, tantrums he may have exaggerated for the purpose of political intimidation. Actually, in one famous episode, he became so furious, he threw himself on the floor and started chewing the carpet. Then, in 1168, for reasons unknown, Eleanor left Henry's court and transferred to Poitiers in Aquitaine, where she ran her duchy and set up an independent court. While some sources claim she was an innovator in the arts of courtly love, particularly her famous courts of love, that ruled like a legal court on cases concerning matters of romance, that's likely a myth. However, her court was well known for its patronage of art and poetry, and may have inspired the broad strokes of later tales. We do know, however, that Eleanor was also spending a lot of time in Aquitaine with her favorite son, Richard. Because, you see, Henry had a really bad habit. No, not the philandering, or the anger issues, or the semi-accidentally murdering the Archbishop of Canterbury. No, what I'm talking about is how controlling Henry was. He would never give up even the littlest bit of power. While Henry elevated his eldest living son, also named Henry, to a position of co-monarch, the young king had no real power. And this wasn't even a royal apprenticeship, mind you. He just watched as his father did everything. The same was true of Richard, who he made Duke of Aquitaine, and Geoffrey, who got Brittany. His youngest son, John, basically got nothing, and had to live for years under the humiliating nickname, John Lackland. But even if they had lands, their father still ran those estates as if they were his, and kept them on a tight financial leash. Also, to Eleanor's likely dismay, he consistently meddled in the affairs of Aquitaine. And in 1173, he finally pushed it too far. Hoping to give John something, the elder Henry took three castles from young Henry's territory and gave them to his youngest brother. The headstrong young Henry, only 18 years old, finally reached a breaking point. He fled to Paris and raised a rebellion, sheltering in the court of Eleanor's ex Louis. And there, he gathered allies, including brothers Richard, then 16, and Geoffrey, then 15, supposedly encouraged by their mother. And when Henry called for Eleanor to send him troops, she did not. Her teenage sons were at war with her husband, and Eleanor had chosen sides. Whereas the only sides I'm comfortable with choosing are what goes with my dinner. <laughs> hey, yeah, thank you, thank you, I'll be here all week. Wait a minute, I will really be here all week. Oh, when am I ever gonna find the time to eat right? Oh, Factor, great call, bud. Now, if you've heard me talk about HelloFresh in the past, you know how much I love to cook. But the truth is that sometimes, you know, living this crazy EC lifestyle of ours, there are days that I just can't find the time. So what's a busy bean to do? Frozen meals have too many preservatives and never taste fresh. And delivery, yeah, that ends up putting a big old dent in your wallet right quick. My solution? Factor. The pre-prepared meal delivery service that takes the guesswork out of breakfast, lunch, and dinner with healthy meals that are ready to eat in around two minutes. No prep, no mess. And because fitness starts with food, Factor gives you a ton of meal options to achieve any daily nutrition goals you may have. Everything from keto, calorie smart, vegetarian, vegan options, and more, which you can choose from their awesome rotating weekly menu. For instance, today was a busy one, but rather than eat something bad for me or skip lunch altogether to get my work done, instead I had Thai peanut beef and rice with red chili green beans. And y'all, it was super tasty. And not only did I feel great knowing it was healthy, but it was so fast I was able to get all of my work done early, including this ad read, which means tonight I got extra time to play with Zozo. So this busy fall season, if you'd like to eat better while being better with your time, all you gotta do is head to go.factor75.com slash extra credit 130 and use code extra credits 130 to get $130 off across six boxes. 
And when you do, not only will you be getting fast, tasty meals that fit your life, you'll also be helping out our channel in the process. Ooh, and be sure to check out their smoothies. Did I mention they have smoothies? They have great smoothies. Again, that's code extra credits 130 to get $130 off across six boxes at go.factor75.com slash extra credits 130. A hearty thanks of legend to Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Angelo Valenciana, Arclight Games, Casey Muscha, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, and Skylar Holmes. 